OK, it looks like we have a quorum, so we can call our meeting to order. Um, before uh, we get going, I'll run through the rules around public meetings. Um, so the meetings for the ARPA <coughs> Transitional Advisory or the uh, ARPA Family and Individual Engagement Committee are public meetings as defined by the Connecticut Freedom of Information Act and should follow the guidelines. Uh, as a public meeting is held virtually, it'll be recorded and made available to view on the DDS website. Committee members must make a good faith effort to state their name and title um, each time they speak during the meeting. And if a committee member would like to speak, please raise your hand and one of the co-chairs will acknowledge you. There is no public comment portion to the meeting. Um, members of the public are able to join, watch, and listen only. Um, so our first order of business for the uh, for today is to review and approve minutes from the previous meeting. Um, Shannon sent the minutes out. Um, so if you um, have taken a look, if there's any um, amendments or um, changes. Uh, if not, I can entertain a motion to uh, to approve the minutes. Can I, anyone want to make a motion to approve or any comments or suggestions or amendments? I just Hi, this is Cheryl Ellis, oh. Director of DEI um, at DDS. I make a motion to approve the minutes as uh, submitted. OK, thank you for breaking the ice. And okay. do I have a second? Yes, Denise Palladino, DDS, Self-Determination Director, seconds. OK, um, so all those in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? OK, the minutes are approved. Um, so the uh, next agenda item we have is uh, um, announcements and updates. Um, and we have invited Deloitte uh, to um, give us an update on the um, stakeholder meetings. I think we raised some questions last time and uh, they're prepared to address that. Um, and uh, so why don't we let them get started? I have a couple other updates I'll, I'll cover uh, when we're after their presentation or their report. So Deloitte, you're up. And a little late, this is Greg McMahon uh, from DDS. I didn't identify myself, so please remember to do that, which I rarely do. Awesome. Well, good morning, everyone. This is Julia Oak from Deloitte. Uh, providing a quick update on the stakeholder input sessions and sort of where we stand. Um, so we are tracking to hold the virtual input sessions in January. Um, we'll be holding three distinct sessions with individuals and families. So we'll have a session just for those receiving day services with individuals and families, those receiving residential individuals and families. And then we'll also be um, having an input session with the DDS self-advocates. Um, and I know the Spanish language option was a piece that um, we received feedback on. So we're still working through on our end, identifying some potential options, um, but we're optimistic that there'll be um, some resources within Deloitte that we can leverage to put on um, a session for Spanish language speakers. Um, and so in addition to those three sessions, um, we'll also be having um, input sessions with case managers and providers that will also be split out. Um, by day in residential. All of the sessions will be taking place in January. We'll have a very packed couple weeks returning um, from the, the holiday. Um, and we've put outreach out for those sessions um, via social media on the DDS social media. Um, we'll be capping the sessions at around 20 people. Um, the thought being that, you know, we want to ensure that the sessions are as engaging as possible. Um, and with that, you know, we're going to be tracking registration to make sure that we have representation from across the regions. Um, and the sort of other logistical element is that um, we'll also be offering um, on the registration form 
uh, folks can indicate if they would like support um, with the Zoom um, and doing that at a DDS office. So based on responses to that, um, we'll be working with the DDS team to make arrangements um, if folks do want to attend the session virtually, but have some additional support um, using the technology. And that is all the sort of bullets I had on my end, um, kind of for the updates specific to the stakeholder input sessions. So any questions or comments? Yes. And Julia, this is Greg McMahon from DDS. Uh, what's the timing of the uh, um, invite going out? For individuals and families? Yes. So I believe it has been set out, sent out already through the DDS social media. Okay. I think it went out last week, I believe. Julia Old from Gallup. Uh, this is Shannon Jacobino, DDS on Buds Person. So it's it's only gone out through social media or uh, is there a letter being sent as well? I think given the timing, it's just through social media for the Spanish language session. We're going to be leveraging case managers. Um, so we were able to translate some Spanish for them to send out um, to any folks they serve that speak Spanish. Um, this is Shannon Jacobino, DDS Ombudsperson. I'm sorry. Um, so for the, is social media the only way that you're reaching out to people for all of the family sessions except for the Spanish speaking ones where you'll be using the case managers. Yes, this is Julia Oak from Deloitte. That is correct. Uh, this is Shannon Jacobino, DDS Ombuds person. I don't know that DDS, uh, the DDS Facebook page gets a lot of traffic. Um, I'm happy to try to share that in family groups that I'm a part of, but um, I don't think the DDS page gets a lot of traffic at this point. This is Julia Oak from Deloitte. Um, I'm happy to send you some of the materials, Shannon, if that would be helpful. We have some templated language, um, if that would be helpful. Uh, Shannon Jacobino, DDS Ombuds person. That would be great. Thank you. I see Adriana has her hand raised. Good morning, Adriana Ramirez, Connecticut Family Support Network and also a relative. I have seen the message. So as people are getting that one, the two line message with the tiny URL for day and services, and then they're also adding the tiny URL Spanish message. So it's going out in social media and people are sharing it through email. Great. Right. This is uh, Greg McMahon, DDS. Are there any other questions or comments? Adriana, your hand is still up. Is that left over? OK. OK, thank you, Julia and uh, Deloitte for giving us an update. Uh, it's much appreciated and thanks for taking the feedback from the last meeting. Um, that's very helpful. Um, I have a couple of other uh, updates. Uh, the family letter the, the, that we uh, reviewed um, and had a couple of edits for those edits were put into the letter and uh, it is uh, going out. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure the timing, but it may be today. <laughs> oh, uh, or even the end of last week to individuals and families explaining just the very basic introduction to ARPA. Um, so that as we're beginning to talk more and more about it, people have heard of it and, and know what we're talking about. So uh, that has complete been completed. Uh, another update is that uh, in notice to providers who are interested in participating in the transformation and the incentives uh, went out. It was a interest survey. Um, to see who might be interested. Uh, and 16 agencies responded that uh, said they were or might be interested. About half of those said they were and were planning on submitting a plan and that uh, the other half weren't sure. So they were considering uh, doing that. Uh, it was fairly evenly split across the three regions, and it was fairly evenly split between day and residential. Uh, I think one agency said whole agency transformation was in their plan. Um, so um, 
you know, we started our conversations a while back going over what those incentives were. Um, and so they're beginning to come into action and um, we're beginning to see uh, folks interested. Um, we're pleased that we got a response of that many folks. Um, Deloitte will be sending out um, sort of the plan template for them to review and the some of the details and how to begin submitting their plans so we expect that this will be moving along um, over the next month or so um, start getting some transition plans from agencies so it's so a lot of the work that's been going on is starting to to actually happen um, and you know, get going so uh, that's a that was a very uh, we're, like I said, very pleased to have that interest. We weren't sure whether we'd get people, agencies who were interested in doing something, and, and we had pretty good response for starters. So um, this is part of what's the phase one. It's the initial group, and we'll learn a lot from them. And following that um, phase one, which is up until March, we'll uh, begin some phase two and take lessons learned from phase one and start implementing. So in a sense, this is a pilot uh, uh, in a way of getting to learn how to do this and work with future agencies to do it even better. So that's uh, where we are with that. And I believe those are my updates. Um, one other we had, uh, I'm continuing to work on the rent subsidy issue and I know I've said that multiple meetings in a row. Um, I forwarded on to our expert on rent subsidy and housing issues um, and I'm waiting a response from him um, but it's uh, people are very aware of the issue and are trying to figure out how best to support people um, with uh, their security deposits and rent and making sure people if they leave you know that, that things work out for everybody including providers so um, don't have a much of an update on that at this time so any questions or need for clarification on the updates? And Shannon, I don't know if you had, if I missed any updates that you may be aware of. Okay. Um, the uh, next thing that we were going to look at is uh, we've, uh, since the first meeting we had, I think one of the um, things that the committee has said on an ongoing basis is to help with the transition and to help families in general negotiate DDS in a way that where they're well informed. Uh, we should be looking at having some single site that lists the services that we provide um, that is easy to understand, easy to navigate, and that talks not only about the benefits of each, but also talks about some of the challenges that might be associated with each service type. Um, so we, um, uh, Shannon and I were talking, saying, how are we going to begin to do that? Um, what, what's the best way to begin the process of trying to put together something that will work for everybody? Um, and to that end, uh, We've both been looking at other states and trying to see what other states do and if they have user friendly, easy to navigate ways of describing the services they provide to folks. Um, and uh, we also have pulled up and sent to all of you all of the service descriptions that are essentially what's in our waiver guide, not necessarily family friendly guide. Um, and uh, the, the goal is to have a web based service description uh, that may be accompanied by multi different media types with some videos, uh, written materials um, done in, many, in different languages in a way that works for folks. So that's kind of where we're starting. So what we, Shannon and I thought might be the best way to begin, but we're open to suggestions, was to take those service descriptions um, and take a look at them and ask your thoughts on how we might make what we have easier to understand um, for everybody. Um, so uh, and I see Adriana has a question. Good morning, Adriana Ramirez, Connecticut Family Support Network. Um, my question is based on what 
what do we currently have on the site? From my experience, I know when you search certain DDS services, there's multiple pages that give you different information. So I, I was just wondering if this endeavor of trying to make one place, are we looking at all current website pages that DDS specifically has and getting rid of those and replacing it with what we have or is this going to be addition to because it could still confuse families because depending on how you word the search you can find information about different services on different pages you have a family kind of version so do we do we have do we have basically visuals of the current pages that exist and what information is there for families to kind of see what's already created instead of trying to recreate something and making sure that we're replacing those with what we're going to create so we don't add another um, layer to confusion where you read different pages, I guess is my question. Thank you. Uh, this is Greg McMahon, DDS. Uh, the, um, my understanding is there is a work group uh, that has content experts that's looking at the website. Um, kind of in a more global way. And um, I, in speaking with um, Kevin Brownson, our director of communications, uh, at the end of last week, so telling him what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, by bringing that up, I got uh, the privilege of being assigned to a content expert group to look at the website. Um, so we're um, going to be looking at it, I think, more globally. Um, right now, if you were to go into the website and say, I want to get a list of services, you would be hard pressed to find it. Um, uh, you, you would find it here and there in the scattering of ways and not well defined on separate pages. So it doesn't really exist um, in a very usable form, which I think is part of your point. Um, if you go online, you are looking all over the place and you have to really dig uh, for information to find out what you need. And it's not in one place. So I think our goal here um, is to, to put the service types in one place so that when a family or an individual wants to find out what is IHS, what is CCH, what is a DSO, what is group support of employment, they may see all of those services, at least this is a, <laughs> my vision, on one page um, where they can click on that and they get information that's easy to understand. Um, so that's that's um, my thinking. I, web design is something I know nothing about. So working with the folks as a content expert will probably be helpful. And I believe Shannon's participating in that as well. Uh, uh, yeah, this is Shannon Jacobino, DDS Ombuds person. So I think the information that we get from this committee will obviously be very helpful to Greg and I in being able to work with the, uh, the people who are working on the website. I would also ask um, Adriana, like if you could uh, send me links to some examples of what you're talking about, it would be really helpful because personally, the way I find things on the website right now is I just Google what I'm looking for. I don't go to the website and look for things. I, I haven't had a lot of success in doing that. Um, so if you can give me some examples, because I think that there are probably things buried there that we don't necessarily know about. Um, so if there's like duplication, things like that, sending links would be helpful. Um, this is Greg McMahon, DDS. Um, one of the things that I did learn by looking, I think I looked at eight or nine states um, to see if anybody else had this like beautifully formatted, easy to understand page for individuals and families. Um, I found some pieces, what I looked at, that looked like maybe we could use some of it to make a nicer website, but ultimately um, I did not find a state that had an easy to understand uh, service description uh, that that we could really uh, just say, let's just steal that and use it. Um, so, um, but I think there's good ideas out there. Um, one of, one I had, that I saw just had a single page with easy to read links that were very clear to each site. And then um, in another state there, uh, they had some tabs that described the service and you clicked another tab that might say challenges and another tab that might say benefits. Those seem pretty user friendly, but when you went into them deeper, they were very complicated. Um, so uh, we will, 
but the, the format looked pretty good. So we're going to be talking about things like that. Um, and there's more states to explore um, to see if there's some some ideas out there. And then we'll share that with everybody here um, and try and come up with a, a good way of doing things. Um, any other questions or comments on that? Um, what I think I'd like to do is open what we did send you. Um, and uh, Shannon and I thought it may be best just to begin with uh, one service and have kind of get a sense of the discussion we would have. Um, and I think the agenda indicates we'll talk about in-home supports. Um, and just uh, I'll put it up on the screen and um, we can uh, take a look at it and see does this seem to make sense to people and is it a good starting point and what additional information um, I know we talked about uh, benefits and challenges being included but what what other things uh, people would want to know I think in the end we want it to be understandable and tell people what they need to know without being too technical and not being a multi-page document so let me see if I can successfully call those up you all see the, the screen? So the, the one that we thought we should start our conversation about this with is the first one in home supports. Um, so I know you've got this ahead of the meeting, but if you could just take a quick read of that now and then we'll start talking about how this looks to people um, and what other information you might want to know. Um, and or if there's a better way of going about this task. <laughs> this is Shannon Jacobino, DDS Ombudsperson. I see Dr. Ellis has her hand raised. Good morning, uh, Cheryl, Director of DEI at DDS. Um, Greg, I did get a chance to look at this a little bit before the meeting. And in my reading, I noticed there were two other IH, IHS programs near the bottom. Um, are they significantly different than the first one? I wasn't really sure if they were just kind of different types of IH, IHS and have enough coffee. This is Greg McMahon, DDS. If people don't mind getting a little dizzy here, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom um, and see uh, what we're referencing here. Do you mean like clustered IHS and supportive housing IHS, Cheryl? Yes, yeah, so five and six um, made reference to the IHS continuum. And so I made the presumption that they were part of the number ones like they were some version of number one but i w i wasn't sure and because i'm fairly new i don't know all of the services um in a great amount of detail this is greg mcmahon from dds so yes um the support uh, the five and six uh, clustered ihs in supportive housing are ihs as described in number one with a difference in the type of environment where they where they're offered with some differences so ihs is support offered in the home uh, in a person's home and that might be their family home it could be a uh, their own apartment or it could be a cluster of apartments which is a group uh, apartment in say a complex where there might be four or five apartments where people live um, and they're also getting the same type of IHS support in that environment or supportive housing which is uh, project based where complexes are built with a certain 25% uh, people with disabilities living in that complex but also getting similar IHS support in that so the difference is more the setting that those the IHS services are offered in, um, but in the end it is a very much similar service. The, some of the differences, um, a couple of differences for clustered and supportive housing is there is the agency that is supporting people there has a presence 24 hours a day. Um, and so that we're 
some people who live there can call somebody 24 hours a day. They're not in individual apartments, but they have an office in the complex where they're that's staffed um, 24-7 or available 24-7. So it, it, the primary difference is the lo the type of lo physical location, um, but it's a similar, very similar service there. Does that make sense? It does. Um, okay. Thank you. So I I would just have a suggestion of maybe moving that up, kind of put them together. Uh, th this is Shannon Jacobino, DDS Ombuds person. I think that this is. Um, one of the things that sometimes makes things very confusing for individuals and families in that. Um, I think that we tend to. Uh, organize things based on the type of funding that is used to pay for that service, so we could do in home supports and let people know that you know you can use those kinds of supports in your own home or in these other kinds of settings. Or we could talk about, and I saw this on some other state websites, you know, that people can um, get the supports in their own home if they're living with their family. They can, you know, and there are, or they could get them in their own apartment. You know, like, I don't know if it's always necessary for individuals and families to understand what the waiver support is that they're getting as opposed to, you know, here is my life and how do I get the supports that I need to fit my life? I'm living at home right now with my family. I want to move into my own apartment. Um, are, are you following me? Like, I, I feel like it kind of creates a little confusion when we base all of our definitions around the waiver service as opposed to what's actually happening in an individual's life. I hope that's clear. Or what they want. Uh, this is Shannon Giacomino, DDS Ombuds person. Adriana Ramirez has her hand raised. Um, Adriana Ramirez, Connecticut Family Support Network relative. No, I agree with you, Shannon, because I was thinking the same thing. If it's if it if the if what we're trying to accomplish is is to have the families understand, then we need to come from their perspective because we're trying to convey information that's complex on what is important to them to make sure they understand. So I agree with Shannon almost as thinking of the types of supports based on the living condition. So are you looking to live with, you know, family? Are you looking to live on your own? Are you looking to live with roommates? It bring it more down to what is it that they're looking for, not specifically the jargon of the we can put the jargon afterwards, but how we filter the information so they can search it and and quickly understand okay i am looking for some i my um my sister wants to live in the community she doesn't want to live by herself so she is either looking to live with a roommate or in a in a complex setting so have those choices so that way she knows what programs to specifically look for that are based on that category of living type of living not type of um, waiver or funding. What is that living? Is that living alone? Is that living in your own home? Is that living in an apartment complex? Is that living with a roommate? Separating those those types of categories so that way it's user friendly for them because it's based on what they're specifically looking for and their needs. So I was just wanted to agree with Shannon. Okay, this is Greg McMahon from DDS. So just trying to to think of what that would look like if we were to try and design a um, a, a web page around that concept. Uh, so the idea would almost be a question, ask questions, and based on those answers, it would pop up what fits the questions or the the uh, input of the family or individual. So the, the um, go, uh, go ahead, Adriana. So I'm going to share a link 
in in the chat. I don't know if you can open and share it, but this is sort of DDS had an idea originally and it has to do with life course, but this is kind of it, it it's it's a I don't know how to explain it. It's it's a nice visual to get us maybe thinking about an idea because you can create a page and based on specific categories that you're looking for. So DDS has this. So I don't know if you want to take a second and like click on it and just open it for a minute and everybody can kind of for everybody just wants to open individually. But it's a visual that DDS is trying to do for the families or they were trying or I don't know how old this is, um, but maybe we can, you know, just just to spark ideas. Um, it kind of gives based on their current status of their life. So it's birth to three, transition to adulthood, adulthood, retirement, um, and it helps direct them to particular resources that may, they may need based on that time frame of life per se. Um, so I just wanted to share that link and 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 have you know if you guys want to look at it separately or just to spark some interest um, not interest sorry brainstorming a little bit but I'm very visual and easy kind of oh I might have given you the one that already brings you there hold on let me go back to the other one where to go I've got too many links going here do you see the screen I this is graphic man DDS do you see the screen I just shared Yes, try try this one. Sorry, that one's going straight to transition, but try the, the one I just put in. Apologies. So it's actually family. I'm looking for information, which is great, but it gives you the, the way to to look at all the transitions of life. And I think DDS was on the right track. I just don't know if it's been updated or what the concept was, but it, it kind of helps to categorize where your loved one is and potentially filter out necessary resources and programs based on what, you know, what part of life you're in. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so this is Shannon Giacomino, DDS Ombuds person. Um, I, I do think it's helpful to, if, if we're going to use life course, to try to put things in that framework. Um, uh, it does give a framework for things. I'm, I guess, I don't have the answer to your question, Greg, even though I, I raised this issue, but seeing the way that um, things were laid out in the, what we send people that we have in home supports in two different areas. And then, so I don't know how, how we do, do we say we, DDS offers in-home supports and it can look different ways. These could be supports in your parents' home. These could be supports or in a family home. Th these could be supports in your own apartment. Um, you know, I mean, that might be one way of doing it if we're gonna sort of organize it around what the support is actually called. Um, you know, uh, and, you know, or, or, you know, do you want to live in your family home? Here's the kind of supports that are available. Do you want to live in your own apartment? You know, we have supported housing. We have, you know, uh, um, I think, you know, we're looking to support people who might live, I don't know if we'll call it supported housing in other kinds of clusters, you know, like, I don't know how, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I feel like we have to really put a lot of thought into how we organize that information so that it's clear to somebody if they're making a plan for their life, how they can, what kind of, you know, supports are available, what they can ask for, not necessarily what waiver service is going to pay for it. Um, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, this is Greg from Greg McCain from DDS. I I uh, I think this is you know that when you start talking about this stuff, you realize the layers that we're looking at because since we're talking about IHS being in two other places, it also could be IHS with assistive technology. It also can be IHS with remote supports. It can be um, you know so so the IHS is a very broad category of service um, that can be done in a lot of different ways in a lot of different places in combination with other things. 
Um, so I do think it, it gets pretty complicated in that way. Um, and I, one of the things is I, I'm thinking is that if, you know, the idea of saying what I really want for my loved one or for myself um, is to um, live in a apartment in the community. How can I do that? And then there's a list of service descriptions. That's, you know, that that's that would be very family friendly, I think. Um, but it gets so layered, it also might get pretty complicated. Um, and some of the services people might say they want might not be services they can get. Um, which is the other piece that would be good, but this is meant to be educational. So, um, you know, I, I think that that uh, what it's probably not going to be a simple task <laughs> to put together. Uh, this is Shannon Jacobino, DDS Ombuds person. Adriana has her hand raised. Yeah, I have um, two things that that um, I know people have asked in the past. Um, I hope that we can, as much as we can throughout DDS, we can standardize certain things like clustered living, shared living, self-direction, because uh, um, words are interchanged and that can be confusing with families. I've been to presentations where you, you hear supported living, clustered living, describing the same thing um, to kind of just build in a standard that everybody uses one type of phrase for a particular thing that they're talking about. So I mean throughout maybe staffing or presentations of certain, um, unless they are interchangeable, maybe they are interchangeable, but based on the definitions that we just saw, we saw shared living and we saw clustered defined differently, um, where I've seen them combined describing the exact same thing. So it, it can get confusing that way too, because then people are interchanging words and um and I lost my train of thought for the other thing but um yeah I forgot the other one sorry <laughs> but yeah it's more standardized because even I get confused depending on who I hear it from and who's saying it and you know trying to just understand the difference um the differences thank you this is Shannon Jacobino, duty guest ombuds person. I, I think that that kind of like speaks to my point too, is I think it can be very confusing for people to look at service definitions and try to figure out where they fit as opposed to saying, here's the plan, here's what I want. How do we make the funding that we have fit this plan that I have? And um, I know uh, Dr. Ellis has her hand raised, but I would be curious to hear from like Denise and Jessica, who I think are working with families who aren't always taking a more traditional path, trying to figure out how to piece that funding together. You know, I, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts, but um, Dr. Ellis has her hand raised. Um, thank you, Cheryl Ellis, Director DEI at DDS. And I agree with um, all the statements that have been made just because as a newer person to the system and just trying to navigate my own understanding, um, I do get very confused as to what falls under what and what it means and how do individuals kind of fit into that picture. Um, and as, a, as an individual and as a person who's just trying to understand, the funding probably wouldn't be as important to me as the what is this and what is it going to provide and then i can get you know ask questions about the funding as i get more information but to just even have that basis so i don't know how we can organize it if we're going to use just the titles um like the clustered ihs i don't i don't know how we can organize it if we're going to use just those titles so oh, maybe I don't want to say scrap the titles, but um, block the titles differently or block the services differently might be one way we can look at it. This is Greg McMahon, TDS. Um, I think Adriana is your hand up, I think. 
Hi, Adriana Ramirez, Connecticut Family Support Network Relative. I remember what I was going to say. Um, so I in the definitions or the process that we're trying to get to is how so are we trying to create glossary definitions? Are we trying to create just a, a, enough understanding so families aren't experts because case managers are experts? So it's just enough information for them to kind of help create a conversation with their case managers so the case managers are guiding them further to make those decisions or to provide the information. So I guess my question is, how deep do we really need to make these definitions? Are these just guidelines so um, parents, caregivers have some information background? So when they're speaking to providers, to case managers, to anyone in DDS or providers looking for services, they have a background and then they can have those dialogues and ask questions to their providers. That's what I was at. Thank you. I remembered. So this is Greg McMahon, DDS. Um, I see Jessica has her hand up. Hi, Jessica Sendell, Supervisor of Case Management for DDS. So <clears throat> to this end, I think um, I, I agree that I think an approach that you're talking about, Adriana, makes a lot of sense for families. I think some families want the whole picture though. So in my head, I think starting maybe from the perspective that you're talking about, and again, I know it goes into lots of layers <laughs> and even anything you could put down on paper isn't everything that we can do. You know, I mean, we have so many creative situations that Shannon was mentioning um, that we work with families to, to, you know, to make fit their lives. Um, but I think starting with something basic like the where what it is you envision your life to be, what it is you want, and then as you're going down that path to see what services are truly available, possibly getting into the definitions. I've spent hours and hours on the phone with families explaining all that we have to offer, and it's very confusing. I get it, but some people really want to know every little thing, um, which is hard to detail. <laughs> and I, as I'm having these conversations, I'm like, you know, it can look this way, it can look that way. Like it just, there's so many different ways it can look. Um, but, and the other thing I was going to say, Greg, and I, and I hope you can appreciate this, but in the uh, service definitions that you had sent, I think we should be cautious in using self-determination and self-direction interchangeably, which I know we do all the time with many other terms as we were talking about, but everybody should be living a self-determined life but self-direction is the actual support model. And I know you know that, but I just want to point it out because I see it listed there. And so if we do end up using definitions at some point, just to be cautious around that. And that's it. Now uh, this is Greg McMahon DDS. There's actually a version where I uh, changed that. Um, and it's apparently not this version uh, because I've been having that um, discussion on an ongoing basis with a number of people who uh, see so, uh, who are equating self-determination with self-direction and they are to one is a way of getting services another is a philosophy around your life um so yeah I, I i don't know why it's not in this version i actually kind of raised a little stink about that a while ago <laughs> Uh, this is Shannon Giacomino, DDS Ombudsperson. I mean, I think that the confusion really comes from within DDS, um, right? I think the, uh, you know, uh, self-direction, uh, Denise, forgive me, I can't remember your title, but um, I'm going to actually let you speak to this, Denise. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, this is Denise Palladino, SD Director. Um, just to kind of step back, um, I think Shannon kind of hit it right on the head and I was about to go there. Um, I don't necessarily think that um, it's the definitions so much that are confusing, but people's understanding, internal DDS case managers and folks who might not be as familiar with self-directed services. You know, people offer, when they're meeting with families and individuals, they offer what they know. If you're in private, you're talking about private provider supports. If you're in family support, you're talking about grants and respite and maybe some in-home supports. Um, but I, I, do, I think it's more of a training piece with internal staff, DDS staff, 
um, to get folks to really be comfortable with being able to provide and present all the different potential options that are out there for individuals and families. Um, and yeah, definitions get all sorts of, and, and again, I think that's more of a training thing than anything. Um, Chen, I don't know if I was explaining what you were speaking to or if there's something I need to elaborate on, but yeah, I think that too, we, we tend to, um, we kind of just present what we know. Uh, this is Greg McMahon, DDS. Um, so I'm just in terms of kind of where we're, um, what direction to go in based on the feedback that we're having today. Um, I know that the, this conversation started I believe a little bit more uh, kind of where we started today, which was, uh, you know, Pat's not here, but I think Pat Tyler raised this uh, the first time is that we, you know, we need to tell people what the supports are and what the benefits and challenges of those supports are. So the conversation started, I believe, a little bit more about talking about definitions of what each service is and what you know what it brings to people advantages and disadvantages um and um but it i think we may be shifting a little bit in how we present it um in that the usefulness of the definitions maybe isn't what's important as much as um people being able to say this is what i want and some of the, and then a menu of choices comes up based on that feedback or, or something along those lines. I'm trying to figure out what, a, um, and this is premature, I know, and it will change, but what a product would look like that would work for families. Um, or is it a little bit of both? Uh, this is Shannon Giacovino, DDS Ombuds person. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm almost wondering if it's, you know, because I, I hear what Jessica is saying too, and I think it's true that there we don't want to we don't want to not have information available to people, but we don't want to give people more information than what they're looking for. What they we, you know, finding some sort of way to balance that is really difficult. But I think if someone were able to sort of in a residential area say, you know, I want to live in my family home. And then they're, you know, uh, within that, have information about the types of supports that could potentially be available to you if that's what you wanna do, you know? And that would include, you know, the in-home supports, you know, assistive technology. I mean, they're, you know, or I want to live in an apartment by myself you know, what kind of supports. I want to live in an apartment with um, a friend, you know. Um, I don't know how that gets us to things like CCH or, you know, um, you know, group homes and stuff like that. But I, I think if we can maybe try to organize things around what a, a a person's vision for their life might be and what supports are available then, you know, and then people can click in to get more detailed information about what those supports are. But it's not like all right on one page that you have to process everything. It's like you can kind of get as little or as much as you want, but you get enough information to be able to start that conversation with your case manager. Um, about what may be available to you, because not all of those supports are going to be available to people depending on what their funding is. Um, I see that Jessica has her hand raised. Uh, Je Jessica Sundell, Supervisor of Case Management for DDS. Um, I agree, Shannon. In my head, I almost see it as like a choose your own adventure story. Like you, you're clicking down these paths, like maybe on that front page, you're, you're saying, do I want to live at home? Do I want to live independently outside of my home? Do I want to live with others outside of my home? And that might be where you're getting to like CCH. But people, you know, obviously have visions for their lives. 
and what where does that bring you? What is what services do we have to offer depending on what you want in your life? And I think relying on the case manager, although I can appreciate what Adriana was saying about us being the the experts on it, <laughs> Denise is right. We think relative to the division that we're in. Uh, maybe I think a little bit outside of that because I supervise people in all divisions and because in self-direction things get really creative but when you have somebody who's primarily dealing in private they're thinking along those paths people who are in cch and dealing with cch's they're thinking along the cch path and so i think it's it's important to have a place where people can figure out where to go and what they what options they have based on what they might want for their lives that isn't dependent on asking your case manager what their choices are so I think that something like that would be invaluable on the website so that they would have that that like very easy way to get from point A to whichever point you end up at, <laughs> but by choosing what it is that you that you want in your life. So I don't know, Greg, this is an impossible miss it, mission. <laughs> I wish you luck. Uh, yeah, this is Greg McBam, DDS. Um, I think that we as we're talking about this it's it is going to be a sort of challenging to figure out how to format something that works in that way i think it also needs to work in a way where somebody who logs on and says i really don't know what i want at this time what is there and that would show them everything um so that they don't get pigeonholed into it by, by not asking the right questions or they say this is what i want not knowing that there's something else um that they just aren't thinking about so maybe there's a box that, or a so they say i don't know what i want what do you have um that does show everything um so they can start making uh, you know not being pigeonholed but thinking outside of their own box about things that they're just not you know somebody might put in all i want is a cla not knowing that a cluster setting has 24 hour support available um, so they don't say they want that because they don't know it exists. Um, so I think um, uh, using people who know how to design websites is is going to be helpful in how to format that. Um, but in the end, I think whatever the whatever we'll have to have content writers that put things in plain English um, in a way people can understand it. Um, however, it ends up looking um, and ultimately people will need to know whatever the terms are because that's what they're going to be. That's the language they'll hear, hear when we're done. Um, so, um, yeah, this is going to be a, a, a challenging project, I think. <laughs> uh, this is Shannon Giacovino, DDS Ombudsperson. Adriana has her hand raised. Adriana Ramirez, kind of family support network uh, relative. I also want to throw out an idea. So I know we always look at comparing the differences between things. How about grouping services on commonalities? Are you looking for 24 hour care? You can try this housing, this housing, this housing based on on on. Common things that you could still get that that service that you're particularly looking for. So if you, you were saying that if somebody looks for cluster but doesn't realize maybe shared living also has 24 hour depending on what that 24 hour looks like. So potentially finding ways of saying, you know, these three options also have the possibility of 24 hour care. Or these three options also offer community living can look three different ways. But what's what's the 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 main thing that the person is looking for looking to live in the community if you're looking to look you know live in the community that's you know it's more than one option that can get you there um, if you're looking for that type of commonality to help group things together to help people lead them to um a decision based on what they're looking for so if they like i keep going to the 24 hour but if they know their family member needs 24 hour and they can say okay type of supervision needed or breaking those down um, based on categories, you know, how we ha and I'm sure there's checklist or something that that is breaks down the different service types within, let's say, residential and, and grouping those commonalities. You know, where does where does where can you 
have some type of support person or things like that. It was just an idea to, because I know we're always thinking of what's the difference and maybe grouping what's similar so they can see all the options that apply to a particular um, situation if there is more than one option. Uh, this is Shannon Giacobino, DDS on Bud's person. I know we have a couple of other items on our agenda, Greg, so I, I'm wondering if we might need to, um, you know, I, I don't think that this is the last time we're going to be having this discussion, nope. <laughs> but I don't know if we're going to come up with anything more concrete than what we already have at this point, so I think we have to get through the agenda. I think we've given ourselves a lot to think about. Um, yeah, we can we can go ahead and move on. Um, the uh, let, any last comments from the this Greg McMahon from DDS? Any last questions, comments before we move on? OK, uh, this is Greg McMahon, DDS. Um, the next agenda item uh, is around the Teams page. Uh, I think in a past meeting, Shannon mentioned that we had created a Teams page. Um, and um, as is often the case, uh, it's not a as simple a process of using Teams as we might think. Um, and uh, to use the Teams page, uh, we would need everybody to register and you have to enter codes and things like that to get into it. Um, and there may be other ways of doing doing things that aren't teams. So, um, and uh, we're not really prepared to get into what all those are because I think the first question we wanted to answer is what is it people want to get out of the teams page concept? So, um, a teams page or something similar. Um, do we want to have the ability to view all documents that we have put forth? Uh, do we want to have the ability to post documents and edit them as a group, like a Google Doc type of thing? Do we want to have the ability to have a chat function? Do we want to have the ability to call up uh, recordings of past meetings? Um, and um, I think if we can determine what would benefit the group in using Teams, we can bring that back and choose the best tool. Um, whether it be teams or or something else. Um, so um, I don't know, Shannon, if you 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 initially began the process of looking at a teams page. I don't know if you want to expand on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is Shannon Jacobino, DDS Ombuds person. I thought it would be easier uh, for people to have one place to go for all of the information. I know it's difficult for me sometimes to um, even though I have a folder with all of this information, um, I thought it would be great for us to have one place that has all of the information that we um, have, are working on together. But I also thought that it would be good to have a place for us to have documents that we could update in real time. So we are trying to compile a list of uh, questions individuals and families might have. And if something occurs to you, uh, outside of a meeting for anyone in, on the committee to have a place where they could go and just put that question down so that you don't forget it. Um, so for me, those that's what I was really thinking um, would be important, especially since we're probably going to be meeting for quite a few months more. Um, I think just to kind of make things easier for people. Um, but I don't know what other people's thoughts are around that, and, and we wanted to hear what you all thought. Um, uh, this is Shannon Jacobino, DDS Ombuds person. So do people think that that's an important thing for us to have, just what I was saying and what Greg raised, or are we okay with things the way they are? Because, you know, I think it's a matter of whether or not we're going to expend the um, time and resources trying to explore something else. So if people like the idea of having some sort of format that we could use as a team in the ways that Greg and I la laid out, if you could just give a thumbs up, <laughs> 
we'll do it. And if people don't think it's important, that's OK, too. We just we'll probably won't pursue it. So can people just let us know what your thoughts are? All right, Dr. Ellis gave us a thumbs up. Adriana has her hand raised. Adriana Ramirez, I was just going to say I, I can do either one. I am. I can talk from being outside of DDS and having access to two teams through a channel, another committee I'm with. So I see the benefits of either or. So my vote is for either or really at this point because um, it just, I guess, depends on how we want to organize things. But being outside of DDS or .gov, CT.gov, I can tell you channel does work. It, it is it is quirky, um, but so either way is 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 my vote. This is Greg McMahon from DDS. Just so the, if if we were to stay within the Teams environment, which you know it's, it almost would make sense since we use Teams anyway, but it can be a little more complicated at times. You have to give your cell phone number every time you log on. You have to wait for a code to come through on a text. You have to enter that code to get in, um, and uh, there's some restrictions on it that that uh, people might not prefer. And there's other tools where you may not have to do that. Um, but before I go on, because I think we really want to hear from all you folks, I see Jerry has her hand up. So, yes, I guess uh, this is Jerry Kogut, a uh, parent and also a uh, board of Mid State Arc. Um, I'm just, you know, concerned about the technology of it. You know, for example, today I had a hard time coming in to this meeting, so that would just be my concern. But to have uh, life being more simple and have one place would be very helpful. This is Greg McPam for DDS. Adriana, you have your hand up. Adriana Ramirez, Connecticut Five Support Network relative. Yes, I did want to. I did want to tell you the way I was invited to the other committee. It is different. It's an invitation where you're not actually logging into Teams. You click on. It's different than what you created and what I. Someone else has tried to create the thing. So I will send you the person's name that in IT that did it. It doesn't ask for a code. I don't need to log in. I just need to go back to that particular email and click on the channel. The other way I've been invited to other ones, it does. It wants me to like put a code like the DDS system. So however they did it as a guest, there is no code, there's nothing. As long as I don't log directly into Teams, I go into that email and click on the channel, it brings me right in without asking me anything. So apparently there's two ways to do it because others have tried um, and it does, it tries to ask me a code and sending me a text. So I know there is a way that you can do it and it works fine. You just have to go in from that email. So I wanted to offer that. This is Shannon Jacobino, DDS Ombuds person. When you do it that way, Adriana, do you have the ability to edit any documents or only view documents? No, I can edit. I am actually a member of it, but I am a guest in the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it gives these. Sorry, Adriana Ramirez, kind of support network relative. Uh, yes, it does give me. It, it gives me access as a member, and I can, you know, because I've added meeting minutes and things like that. Um, but there is no logging in, and my name shows up. However, they created me and things like that. Um, I don't have like reactions. You know, I don't have the full teams, but I have access to the actual channel and things like that. Um, but there is no code. There's no texting. I don't get the Connecticut.gov Microsoft thing where I get with everyone else trying to figure out how to log in. So however they did it, it's very user friendly. You just click on that and it brings you in. Shannon Jacobino, DDS Ombuds person. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, do you have your hand raised again, or is that from before? Sorry, that this is Jerry Kogan, uh, parent. Yes, that was from before. So I'm trying to I'll lower hand. All right, this is Greg McBann from DDS. So um, I had a conversation uh, with Kevin Bronson about the team site, um, and we initially had asked him to present on it today, but um, that's when I learned that there's many different ways to do this, some of which, as you said, Ariana, are more user friendly. Um, so what, what we really need to do if we want to move forward with having a site is say, this is what we want to Jan, who's in our um, 
IT, um, and he will tell us what's the best way to get there. Um, so uh, if we think, I think what we want it to be as simple as possible, we do want the ability to read documents and we want the ability to potentially edit documents, add ideas to things. Uh, and we want to have a place where all of our files, uh, uh, anything we've created or worked on can be open to look at. Um, and uh, is there anything else people would find useful in a site like that? Perhaps have the meeting minutes and recordings of our meetings on there as well, if you want to go back and revisit something. Is there anything else people would like to see? And I guess back to Jana's original, uh, Shannon's original question: Do do we want to do we want a site? And I think we had a uh, could do it or not do it is okay. I think Jerry's comment was it'd be helpful if it's not too complicated. I don't know if what other folks are thinking. This, uh, is, this is Shannon Giacomino, DDS Ombuds person. I, I say, Greg, why don't we go back and see what's available and see how simple it is. And if it's easy to do and easy to set up, um, then we'll go for it. If not, then I think it's probably not worth the investment in time because it doesn't seem like people are really itching to have something like this. <laughs> so. <laughs> OK, this is Greg McMahon, DDS. Um, I think we can move on to the next agenda item, uh, which is open discussion, um, including questions individuals and families may have about the ARPA process um, or the ARPA transformation. Um, I think, uh, Shannon, I th in our discussions, I think we thought it might be a good idea to have this be a standing agenda item as people are as we're talking about to kind of keep a running tally of questions people have that ultimately we either can find the answers for you or it can be the kind of thing that ends up being an FAQ or informs how we structure um, the information we put on the web. Um, use that information in any way that's helpful to better communicate with individuals and families. So um, I uh, in so if there's or if there's any other topics that we might want to talk about at future meetings, we could go ahead and talk about that in open discussion as well. To scrub McMahon DDS, any uh, you know, I, I I don't know if you think it'd be helpful, Shannon, to post Pat's questions or to. Uh, uh. I would say uh, this is Shannon Giacomino, DDS on Buds person. I would say um, I can uh, send the questions out to people prior to the next meeting. And if people see any additions they want to add, you know, then please uh, bring those to the next meeting. Um, but we have about 14 minutes left and we have a couple more items on our agenda. So I would say unless anybody has any burning um, questions or things that they want to discuss, maybe we could just save that for next time. All right, this is Greg McMahon, DDS. The other thing that you can do, if you have a question that pops in your mind at any time, uh, you can forward that to either me or Shannon. Um, so it doesn't have to wait till the next meeting. If you're sitting somewhere and you want to send it out before you forget it, um, you know, go ahead and forward that on to us and we'll just keep a running tally of those, um, anything we have. Is there any other uh, discussion on any other topic that we've been covering? Uh, sort of the open discussion for uh, part of our agenda. OK, hearing none. Uh, we, Shannon, I sent uh, the uh, proposed meeting schedule for the coming year. Um, I know since we last met, she sent out a poll and kind of tried to work on seeing if we could uh, adjust the day, and I don't think that's going to work. So uh, what we were proposing was we're going to keep the meetings at, from 10 to 1130 every other Monday pretty much through the year. Uh, if you look at the 
uh, list Shannon saying you might see a gap here and there and that is accommodating holidays that fall on Mondays that we might have otherwise been meeting. Um, but pretty much it continues our schedule moving forward as we've been doing it uh, since we started. Um, this, uh, I think we're going to look to see if we can approve that schedule if that works. Um, any any thoughts on that? Shannon Giacomino, DDS Ombudsperson. Does anybody want to make a motion to approve the schedule? Jenna Ramirez, Connecticut Family Support Network. I motion to approve our 2023 schedule. Uh, this is Greg McMahon, DDS. Jerry, you have your hand up. Do you need a second? So do the second. Okay, That's Jerry you. Kogan, parent, mid state Thank you. So I, I guess we have a motion to approve the uh, schedule uh, that I sent out. Um, it's been uh, um moved and seconded so all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Okay, our next agenda item um similar to the approved meeting schedule, our next meeting is scheduled for January 9th at 10 a.m. Um as I mentioned before, this one is sort of skipping over uh, one of our two week periods based on the holidays. So we're, we're actually going to be going three weeks between meetings um, and then start the every other moving off from that. Um, so um, hopefully we can see everybody next year <laughs> at uh, our first meeting of the year. OK, um, the next agenda item, this is Greg McBan, DDS, is to adjourn. Um, but before we do, I just wanted to thank you all for um, participating actively in our in our committee. Uh, we have great discussions sometimes over pretty complex concepts, um, and I do appreciate um, what we're working on. I think we're make, ultimately going to come up with some pretty good work that will help individuals and families. So it's much appreciated, um, and I hope everybody has a great um, holiday season. And with that, I move to uh, accept the motion to adjourn. Denise Palladino, DDS, SD Director, motion to, <laughs> to adjourn. Second. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Oh, I guess all in favor of adjourning. Bye. Bye. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays. Happy New Year. Happy Thank New you. Year. Bye.